Okay, so I wanted to put together a video. So I have a lot of modelers and I've had a lot of modelers in the past. So I've had experience of, I think, basically all of the key modelers. And I'm not an expert on anything, but I wanted to share with you sort of uh, a bunch of tips that I think you should know as someone who uses modelers. And these are things that I use across all of the modelers to solve some of the problems that I think can occur for any of us. I think the point is for some of us that we might be coming to a modeler for the first time from a real amp. And it's important to realize that real amps do still exist for a reason. That jumping into the modeling space is a bit of a paradigm shift. So the way to think about this really is instead of you thinking that the modeling thing is gonna replace your amp, what you're really doing is essentially taking something like an amp, putting a microphone in front of it, and then you're hearing that back essentially, you know, so like the experience of being in a studio, you know, not in the live room with the amp, but in the studio where you're hearing the amp come back through microphones. And Joe Satriani has said about this, you know, that you go into the studio, you're used to the sound of your marshals on stage and stuff. And you go into the studio, you put two mics in front of it, you get into the control room and you say, yeah, that's right. Actually, microphones aren't ears. Everything sounds different anyway. So, you know, if you're thinking about making comparisons where you're saying, well, actually, when I play with a real amp, I get this feeling. The modeling stuff isn't necessarily going to get you right there because you're putting a microphone essentially in front of a cab. The thing that you lose is the sound of an amp in the room, the reflections of a space, the, the low end kind of rumble in the back of your trousers and stuff. There are things we can do, but um, if you're constantly trying to make that comparison and trying to get back to that, I think it might just be easier just to go straight back to your real amp. And that might not be a bad thing. Real amps are great too. The most common misconception and kind of myth that I see on the internet is that speakers only go up to 5K. Um, now, this isn't true, but I've seen, you know, big YouTubers say this. If you look at a speaker curve from someone like Celestian, although they say, you know, 5K, 6K, you look at a speaker curve, they go all the way up to 20k it's just that the high end is attenuated a bit it's still very much there and you can trial this yourself by kind of putting a hard cut somewhere um, at like 5k or 4k but it's just not the case that real amps don't sound fizzy it's not the case that real amps can't sound spiky it's definitely not the case that real amps with some drive pedals can sound really ugly really fizzy all the sort of stuff that we kind of think of a digital it exists in real amps. If you try putting a fuzz in front of a Fender Princeton with a, a, a Jensen speaker, see what happens. These things, they make these sorts of sounds, right? There's nothing unique about the modeling world that is more likely to be fuzzy or anything. What is unique, I guess, is that you've got combinations of gear way more than you've ever had in real life, you know? So I'm fortunate to have a bunch of gear, but I don't have even like, 5% of what's actually available in even the cheaper modelers, right? So you've got exposure to gear that's just not there. Now, with that in mind that the high end is also there on a real amp, we can use what I think is the most important thing for, for higher gain tones. So this is gonna be increasingly important the more gain you have. So on clean tones, um, using a high cut is not necessarily always that important. As you increase the drive, you also increase the likelihood of getting kind of fizz and a really lively high end. So in most modelers, what I like to do is use a high cut and you can be your own judge of this, but essentially what you're doing is blanketing that higher frequency stuff to, to emphasize the lower end and also the mids and what we really like um, and what cuts through a mix best is kind of that mid stuff the fizz stuff is just fizz. The low end is kind of mush. The, the important part of a guitar is in the mids for, for my money anyway. So I like to, um, especially if it's a higher gain tone, use a high cut that really does shape that quite, quite a bit. Here's an example um, for you. So right now I'm using a quad cortex on the floor um, and we got a high cut on this. So this is without the high cut. <laughs> The 
other way that you could think about the, the high cut is effectively doing, when we are standing with our amps, generally there's like we're maybe five foot above them and off axis. So you could think about this as kind of taking our ear away from the cone and moving it up. So essentially what that would do in real life is kind of tame off some of that high end frequency stuff, which I think can make things sound too direct and too kind of fizzy and spiky. Use a high cut, I would suggest kind of after the cab. Some people might do this in the global EQ on whatever device they've got, but uh, the things to bear in mind is that on some devices you've got like a, a slope control. So minus 12 dB is generally one of the stronger kind of slopes. Minus six dB per octave is a bit tamer and that's kind of the choice that I like to use generally because it's a bit less extreme. So you can kind of dabble with it more. I would go down as far as 3K with these high cuts. The cut part of that title is a little bit misleading. Um, actually what you get is like a gentle slope with most devices, right? Um, so don't be too afraid. The, the um, 3K is just where that's gonna start and it's gonna be minus 6 dB per octave thereafter. So you're really still gonna maintain most of your signal. It's just gonna gently sort of trim in the top. Um, but experiment with high cut, I would say that is one of the real keys to getting smoother tones. You do really, I think, there's no substitute for actually getting your preset or your modeler in front of uh, the PA that you're going to be using and trying it at volume. Things don't necessarily translate massively well from studio monitors to PA monitors. Um, PA monitors are a very different beast. Um, so there really is no substitute for just getting out there and trying it. For this reason as well, I encourage anyone with a modeler don't just rely on desktop editors and plugging it into your computer because at some point in the field, you're probably gonna have to actually try and use the unit itself. This is why on my channel, I like to actually use the unit hands-on so that when it comes to gig time, hopefully I know how to actually work the thing and I'm not embarrassingly there trying to turn on or off a chorus. One thing as well that I see a lot of advice on is around the use of compressors um, and Compressors are used a lot by lots of different people and I'm not sure quite why you would necessarily want a compressor always on at the end of your chain or always at the start of your chain or three compressors throughout your chain. Typically, one of the things that I, I see people say is that um, modelers are, are more compressed than a real amp. So why would you then want to compound that problem by also having added compression? Another thing I read is oftentimes uh, when there's been like a firmware update with Fractal or something like this, people say, oh, I was able to get rid of all these compressors and the tone is much better now that they've updated this. And I sort of semi think that maybe those compressors were making a bigger difference than the firmware update was. So try turning your compressors on or off and seeing what they're actually doing. If you try and actually match the volume level, you may find that you're just boosting signal or, or reducing signal or, or whatever it is you're doing. It may not actually be beneficial. The thing that I like about a real amp is dynamics. And what we're doing with the compressor is actually reducing dynamics. So when you pick lighter, it's gonna be louder. And when you pick heavier, it's gonna be less loud. Uh, what we're doing with a compressor is squishing these things it's not necessarily a beneficial thing all the time to have on every preset at all. So consider that, consider the advice, and maybe try it for yourself. Myself, personally, I can use a compressor up at the front of a chain, but I never use one at the end because that's not what I would do in the real world with an amp. Talk about the real world. Try and keep these signal chains to start with something like you would in real life. Uh, what that means is compressors, drives, fuzzies in front of the amp, amp to cab and then you know delays and reverbs uh, I tend to put after the cab because I want them to be stereo um, some people put a spring uh, between the amp and the cab to try and get that more realistic but I doubt it makes that much difference because IRs I think are a linear response so it doesn't actually matter where you put those and just find what works best for you but I would start initially building rigs that are based on real life whether it's someone like Andy Timmons I've, I've watched his videos and looked at his rig rundowns and tried to replicate it, you find that actually the results do work when you follow what they're actually doing quite closely. It's what I found anyway. And then the last kind of tip is that 
this is something that people don't really, I think, get right with real amps either. But if you're gigging and you have a, a solo to take, you do really need to boost that solo. Um, now, in the real world, I had an amp, the, the Mesa Boogie Nomad, which has a separate control for solo. So you could boost, you have like two volume controls. The Lone Star has that too. What I do in the modeling world is I tend to have like a 4 dB or something like that boost happening somehow. So in the Helix, that would be the channel volume on the amp. In Neural, I would also do that with the, the channel volume or the level in the amp. Uh, in Fractal, I actually have an enhancer that turns on and that boosts things by 4 dB. But you do, if you want to be heard during your solo, you should consider boosting the mids and you should consider an actual level boost of 4 dB. Now, if you're going into a compressor at the end of your chain, bear in mind exactly, this is the type of thing I'm talking about, that that is necessarily gonna squash your signal. So a 4 dB boost further up the chain will actually end up being a more squished signal um, at the end of the chain, if that makes sense. Those are kind of my tips and some of my thoughts about how to get along with this modeling stuff. Uh, I've found it, really, really, really enjoyable to use all these different modelers. Um, the more that I use them, the more that I get confident with using them. Um, there's loads and loads of helpful stuff online from other people making videos about this sort of stuff. Some of it is true, some of it's based a little bit in myth, but generally the advice tends to be fairly good, you know, using low cuts and high cuts appropriately. The reason I don't favor low cuts for me is because the thing that I miss most with a modeler is that feeling of the thump from an actual amp. So I don't wanna then tame that out, um, just me. But yeah, high cuts, low cuts, consider whether that compressor at the end of your chain is actually necessary. Um, stop necessarily trying to think about it being compared to a real amp because it's a bit of a different thing. If you want to get that real amp, amp thing live, what I found works best for me is plugging into the return of an actual tube amp. Um, that does seem to do the job. Um, I've tried full range flat response speakers. I didn't have as much fun as I've had plugging into an actual tube amp with a modeler. I know it seems weird and it seems wrong and it seems like it shouldn't work. I used the IR still on, but to me, it seemed to work really well. Um, and you don't get any of that high end spiky stuff because you've got the cabs on. So yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments, things that have worked for you. I guess another point to make is that a lot of these modelers um, there's a little bit of a fight for modeler supremacy, but the experience actually of using most of these modelers tends to be the same. You'll see the same questions in every single group, whether it's Kemper, Fractal, Neural, Helix. Uh, how do I get this thing to work live? You know, I'm finding things too spiky or there's too much low end or, you know, uh, when I go live, all of these things sound different to at home. These are common problems across every modeler. So buying the next modeler won't necessarily fix any of these things. So look for advice and you know generic advice and even watch videos from other modeling devices and see what it is that they're actually doing within the blocks and tone wise. And you can follow that advice on basically any modeler and generally you will get a similar result. This for me has been the case. You know, it's across the board true that if you use a high cut, you get less of that end, high end spiky stuff. It's across the board true that you're going to want to boost for your solo. It's across the board true that if you put a compressor at the end of your chain, it's going to lessen your kind of dynamic range um, and maybe enhance your dynamic feel. Be kind of open-minded to it, I would say. Don't necessarily think too much with rose-tinted glasses about the real amp thing. Comparisons are the route to misery, probably. Um, so stick with what you've got for now and try a few things maybe. Cheers.